how to talk about behaviour so students listen. There are all kinds of things that can stop your students from actually listening to you. Number one sin, which I know is a fault of mine, is that I have a bit of a tendency to drone on at my kids when they're messing around for me. So I think the first thing to say is, say it once. Don't go on and on about it. We all remember from when we were at school, teachers who used to nag us, and it didn't make any difference. I think the second thing that stops children from listening to their teachers is that they're not actually focused on you when you begin to talk. So do not start talking to your children until you've looked around the room and made sure that every single child is focused on what you're saying. And then maybe the third thing that can be a problem is that children get distracted by things that are going on around them. So if you really need them to listen, then encourage them to be still and focus visually as well as just silent and listening. One of the things that we tend to do as teachers is the kids are talking and we want them to listen to us because we need to teach them. And so we start going, OK, everybody, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And we expend huge amounts of energy trying to pull the kids to us. The thing I always say to teachers is, make the kids do the work. So you pause, you use a signal, and then you force the children to bring themselves to you rather than constantly dragging them towards you by going on at them. So there's lots and lots of different techniques you can use to get children quickly focused and paying attention. What tends to happen is we choose one technique and then we stick with it and stick with it and stick with it and the children quickly get bored and lose interest in it. So perhaps you do hands up for attention and you expect all the children to put their hands up. But after a while, the hands are kind of half going up and then the hands don't really go up at all. And then you're stood there for 10 minutes and nobody's listening to you. So one thing I would say is keep it moving a bit. So maybe use hands up for a couple of weeks, but then say, right, kids, we're going to have a different silence signal this week. We're going to do call and respond, or I'm going to give you an oral signal, or I'm going to do a movement, or we're going to do something together like head, shoulders, knees and toes. When the kids are actually physically doing something, so touching their heads and their shoulders, they're far less likely to be able to talk at the same time. So tone of voice and volume are hugely, hugely important. They are underestimated, I think, in being able to get the kids to focus on you. Let's take tone of voice first of all. So when you're working with children, you need to over-exaggerate your tone of voice. If you're disappointed in them, you need to sound really, really, really disappointed. If you're surprised at their behaviour, Gosh, surprised to see you doing that. I would have thought you'd want to go to break on time. When you over-exaggerate tone, children are much more able to read your meaning, and particularly if you work with children who have English as an additional language. Now, when it comes to volume, the biggest mistake we make as teachers is we get overexcited or we get overstressed and we start talking really loudly to the class, and then the kids get louder and we get louder. Somebody said to me a few weeks ago that they have a rule at their school that the teachers never talk more loudly than the children. And what they had realised in that school is that the quieter you talk, the more the children have to listen to you. There is no shortcut to getting your kids not to interrupt you. I sometimes wonder if they are genetically programmed to interrupt their teachers. So I'm afraid the only solution is that you are going to have to train them up to listen, to focus and not to interrupt. And the way you have to go about doing that, I'm afraid, is that you have to literally pause every time they interrupt you. 
try not to acknowledge the interruption. So if it's a child shouting something out when you've asked a question, don't acknowledge that that child has said anything at all. Look around, take a pause, take a breath, and then go, thank you, you're listening really beautifully. Would you like to give me the answer? Every time you react to an interruption, you are basically training your kids in how to interrupt you. You are training them to interrupt you, to take you off track. What you have to show is that you just don't respond to the interruptions. And over time, depending how old they are, they will gradually do it less and less and less. The way you lay out your classroom, so the environment itself, is really crucial in the kind of behaviour you will receive. Have a think about where the most difficult children are sitting. So if you've got a child who always tends to shout out, then position them close to you, particularly if you're doing carpet time. Have them right in front of you where you can just do a very low-key signal so nobody else needs to know that you've signalled to that child. The other thing to think about is how are you going to lay out the room? And one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is that you need to be able to move around the room and get into a position where you can be close to each and every child. So if your room has space in it, then check that you can circulate around that space so that the children never know when you might pop up behind them to keep an eye on their behaviour. One of the best ways to get children to retain information is to explain things really, really clearly. One of the things I work on a lot with teachers is the skill of giving instructions. You would think that it was really simple to give instructions in such a way that children would understand, but in reality it's probably one of the most complex things that we have to do. And the first key bit of advice I say to teachers is say to your kids, when I say go, I want you to begin. Because every single child in the world, the minute you start telling them what you need them to do, they'll be off trying to do it. So give them cues. Make your instructions really clear and very, very simple. So don't overcomplicate things and use repetition. Don't say it once and expect that everybody has listened and understood. Say what you need, ask a child to repeat it back to you, say it again, check with another child, say it again. Don't assume that because you've said something, the children both heard it and processed it as well. If you have one child who completely refuses to listen, there are various different methods that you could use. First of all, if you've got a TA working with you, you might ask the TA to take that child to a different space while you do the whole class teaching bit of the lesson. The next thing you can try is you can try praising other children who are doing exactly what you want. Thank you for listening, that's great, that's beautiful listening. Wow, this class are listening so beautifully. And what you're doing is you're basically ignoring the thing that is happening that you don't want to happen. Unfortunately, what you'll find is that some children have a very nice habit of pointing out the difficult child to you. They go to you, Miss, Miss, Benny over there, he's talking over you. You need to stop him, Miss. And you're like, oh, thank you. I was ignoring that attention seeker. When that's the case, I would use non-verbal signals. So again, I would stop, I would pause, I would breathe, and I would give Benny the benefit of my look. And those are some of the things I would try as a starting point. There are lots of different things that stop children engaging with what the teacher is telling them. Sometimes it can be to do with SEND. So perhaps they have issues with their working memory. Maybe they have a specific disability, so they can't hear you properly, but it's never been picked up on. So there can be lots and lots of different problems going on here. 
Sometimes it's that they don't see the value of what you're trying to teach them. So one of the things I always encourage teachers to do is to explain to the children how this is relevant. Now that's not the same thing as saying only ever teach children things they enjoy. Because that was a nonsense. I mean, the curriculum just doesn't allow for that, even if it was a good idea. But what you can do is you can show them how this bit of maths relates to the real world how it will matter to them later on, how it can help them understand more about their world. So make it relevant, make it topical, and make it engaging. I think where a child has built up a strong relationship with their teacher, where they trust their teacher, where they know that their teacher wants the best for them, where they understand that the teacher is focused on them and their learning, then that child is more likely to do what you ask them to do. That's not to say that it's some kind of magic recipe where every single child will suddenly behave perfectly and you can change the world. Remember, they are kids. And if you think back to when you were a kid, I bet there were times when you couldn't really see the point of what your teacher was telling you.